Hi everyone, my name is Sam Sharp and I'm excited to talk to you today about developing LGBTQIA plus inclusive biology classrooms and curricula. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that I'm giving this presentation on stolen land, which is the current home to four federally recognized Native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska. Due to the virtual nature of this conference, many of you are not in the same place as me, and if you are in North America, you can figure out which ancestral lands you're on using this website. I'd also like to note that as I discuss today cultivating respectful attitudes and practices to support sex and gender diversity, I want to acknowledge that European colonists historically targeted, stigmatized, and oppressed indigenous peoples for having cultural gender roles beyond the male-female binary, and that this violence continues today. I'd next like to share a quote from the feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed who writes, We learn about worlds when they do not accommodate us. Not being accommodated can be pedagogy. We generate ideas through the struggles we have to be in the world. We come to question worlds where we are in question. And because in my experiences as a biology student, instructor, and researcher, I have come into question many times, I want to share with you some of the questions that I have developed as a result of this experience and how I think we can use these questions to lead us to ways of teaching that better accommodate all of our students. So I want to ask us, what do students learn about human sex, gender, and sexuality in their biology classes? Frequently in introductory biology classes, human biological sex is shown as purely chromosomal, binary, and fixed at conception. Human reproduction is shown as an event that takes place between two individuals with different karyotypes that are described with culturally gendered terms conflating sex and gender together. And the only type of human relationship we're shown is a heterosexually, heterosexual reproductively focused relationship, which through its exclusive inclusion in our biology textbooks is given biological status, whereas other types of human rep reproductive events and relationships are not shown. And so the next thing I want to ask is how is this not accommodating to all students? For one thing, it doesn't include lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, or asexual people as part of human biological diversity at all, which means that students who come from these identity groups do not see themselves represented. This type of teaching can also enforce for our straight, cisgender, and endosex students that their genders, bodies, and relationships are the only ones that are normal, natural, or biological. And this type of teaching can decrease the likelihood of LGBTQIA plus students pursuing science and biology further because they do not see themselves represented. And this type of teaching can also, for all of our students, enforce homophobic and transphobic arguments they may have heard that rely on concepts of biology to enforce the idea of what is the right way to have a sex or a gender and what constitutes a natural reproductive pairing or relationship. And these types of arguments are used all the time to pass laws and policies which deny LGBTQIA plus individuals access to medical care, legal rights, and life chances overall. So given that this is a complex problem that will require many different solutions in different domains, the thing that I think we should ask ourselves as biology instructors is how can we teach biology in ways that are more accurate, comprehensive, and inclusive? And I think we can start off by getting away from this common assumption that biological sex is always binary, always comes in just two flavors, and is always fixed. Because biological sex diversity across taxa is so much more creative and interesting and fun than that. Not every organism has sex or sexes, like these New Mexico whiptail lizards that only have one sex and reproduce asexually. There's organisms that rather than just having two sexes have thousands of mating types, like these mushrooms in the phylum Basidiomycota. There's organisms where a single individual can produce both different types of gametes, like in snails and most flowering plants. And there's organisms that have two separate sexes, but each individual can change sex over time, such as in clownfish that do sequential hermaphroditism. When we talk about and define biological sex in a specific species, I think it's important to not assume that everyone knows what biological sex means and that it's always the same. I think it's important that we talk about what gametes are and how they relate to commonly used definitions of biological sex. Um, describing one gamete as large and immobile, being the ova, and the other one as small and mobile, and which is the sperm. And once we've established these are common gametes, we can talk about how in some organisms a single individual can produce both types of gametes in monoecy, 
and in other species we need a separate individual to produce sperm and to produce ova in dioecy. And when it comes to sex determination, I think it's important to clarify that, yes, sometimes sex is chromally, chromosomally determined, but other times it's determined by egg incubation temperature, and sometimes it's determined by social interaction, such as in the common slipper limpet, where sex is determined by whether a larva falls down and hits the ocean floor, or a larva falls down and lands on top of a conspecific. When it comes to human biological sex, I think we need to be very careful and nuanced because of the many ways that cultural understandings of sex and gender shape our views of human sex characteristics. And so I like to define human sex characteristics as a collection of variable traits related directly or indirectly to sexual reproduction. And we have primary sex characteristics, which include hormones, um, different sex chromosomes, how our brain develops prenatally in response to those things, and internal and external body structures present at birth. Generally, human sex is designated at birth based upon only the appearance of external sex characteristics without considering in detail what other aspects of sex traits might be present at that time. We also have secondary sex characteristics which develop during puberty and include things like facial and body hair, body size, shape and fat distribution, and vocal range. And so given all of these characteristics, the different configurations of sex characteristics that some people have mean that they are intersex, which is a term that refers to those whose bodies defy a common understanding of sex as a simple male or female binary. And some people are identifiable as intersex at birth, and other people are not able to figure out that they're intersex until puberty, and some people figure out much later or not at all, just depending on how these traits manifest. Approximately 2% of the population is intersex by current definitions, which is about the same percentage of people worldwide who have red hair, and different definitions of intersex that include more types of human sex variation could mean that as much as 10% of the population would fit this definition. And I just want to share this diagram, which is the Quigley scale used to categorize external genitals of individuals with androgen insensitivity syndrome to show that this idea of ex um, of labeling people with a binary sex at birth based on genital configuration doesn't actually work in every case because of this full spectrum of variation in genital configuration, and it's not just genitals that vary this way. Every aspect of human biological sex variation varies along a spectrum and interacts with other sex traits, as is shown in this infographic from Scientific American that shows a variety of the different ways that human sex can vary and some of the conditions that result from that. And so given that human biological sex is so varied, um, without even beginning to talk about gender, I do want to briefly address some questions about gender and how, if, why, and might we talk about this in biology classes. So I've often heard questions like how many genders are there, how can I tell what someone's gender is, and why should I teach about gender in biology class? And so I like to describe gender as a form of self-knowledge that occurs within a cultural context. So which of the gender categories available in my cultural context do I feel I belong to? Do I belong to more than one? Do I belong to none of them? And this, it's important to note that many historical and modern cultures have more than two accepted gender categories. So the idea that you can only be a man or a woman is pretty narrow and ahistorical. And so how do you tell what someone's gender is? So people make choices about how to express their gender in a cultural context through gender expression, but that's not necessarily a reliable marker of what someone's gender is, and people can also change their biological sex because of how they feel about their gender. So examples of this include getting gender-affirming surgeries or taking hormone replacement therapy. And so because the ways that people express their genders vary so much, you can't actually tell someone's gender by looking at them. And lastly, why should I teach gender in biology class? So not mentioning gender at all in biology is in fact teaching about gender because many biology textbooks conflate terms like male and female and man and woman. And if you don't say anything about gender being different from sex and both gender and sex not being binary, you will leave students with the impression that sex and gender are the same thing and that they are both binary because those are the implicit messages that the textbooks are given. And you don't have to go into detail about this, just clarify that gender is a form of self-knowledge that occurs within a cultural context and is not determined by biological sex.
And so given that neither sex nor gender in humans is binary, how do we get these ideas? And this could fill multiple books, but briefly, it comes from eugenics. In the late 1800s, eugenicists misappropriated Darwin to claim that certain individuals or ethnic groups were primitive or degenerate and therefore less sexually dimorphic than the group of people they believed to be the most evolved, which were heterosexual Europeans. And there was this idea that the more quote-unquote evolved you were, the more physical differences there would be between males and females of a certain ethnic group. And a pseudoscience called biometry used this idea to allege that black women, lesbians, sex workers, and other groups of people had atypical and anomalous sex characteristics that justified um, treating them really poorly and subjecting them to experimentation and state control. This is still going on, by the way, if you um, look at news stories such as the um, coercive sterilization of women in ICE detention facilities that happened this year. And so there's a variety of misunderstandings of biological sex that come out of this eugenically constructed sex and gender binary that are still used to justify state experimentation and control on certain groups of people and lay the foundation for laws and medical limitations that prevent transgender and intersex people from accessing medical care with consent at an age where they can give consent in, and receive care that is necessary and affirming. And so I'd just like to end this presentation with a few general suggestions for inclusion. So asking students about correct name, pronouns, and accessibility needs before the first day of class, clarifying inclusion policies in the syllabus, choosing texts with diverse representation, and feeling free to point out when texts are not inclusive if that's inescapable. Being specific when defining and using biological sex and gender rather than relying on assumptions, not gendering non-human organisms, using gamete-focused language rather than gendered language such as ova-producing tissue and sperm-producing structures, providing a variety of examples, and advocating for LGBTQIA plus individuals to be included in diversity initiatives. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening and invite you to contact me through email or follow me on Twitter.